Well, good evening and welcome to this live stream on the 19th of September 2023. Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics here. Hope you're OK. And uh, nice to see everybody on tonight. A lot to talk about. Just before I bring Leith in, let me just remind you, as I always do, that we don't provide specific financial or legal advice on the channel. Please play nice in the chat room. We do moderate the stream. This is as of the 19th of September 23 if you're watching in replay and uh, use that walk the world to get my attention specifically if you want to ask a question because I put them in a separate queue and that means that I spot them and I've also enabled soup uh, I've also enabled super chat um, smooth you might have it on in two places possibly maybe you've got uh, two open um, open streams I don't think I'm uh, doubling up on the audio um, and super chat enabled so if you'd like to make a contribution to what we do here always greatly appreciated or indeed if you want to get your question to the top of the list then uh, please do that okay so let me now um, bring Leith in and uh, before I do that let's get rid of that so we can do that push that button Leith hello g'day Martin g'day everyone thanks for having me on again great to have you back on and uh, a lot of uh, interesting things we're going to talk about tonight, <laughs> Leith. But uh, I've got to start. Your God is going to be squeezy with Albanese was a, was a great uh, piece that you wrote today and really drives the uh, message home, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It does. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, yeah, life's, life's, not good, life's not going to be easy under Albanese, but certainly certainly is going to be squeezy. Uh, we've got record population growth and, um, you know, the federal government's also going to cut infrastructure spending. So, uh that's a pretty bad combination when you've got a housing shortage, et cetera. And it does sort of raise the question, you know, if he thinks that, that there's not enough builders, et cetera, and whatever to build build, build the infrastructure that, that, that they had planned and there's enough money, well, then how are they going to meet that 1.2 million homes target over five years? Um, you know, there's a lot to talk about. Um, you know, a lot, obviously, on this immigration side, because we had the record immigration numbers come out last week, yep. um, totally off the charts. Which I guess we can, you know, get into a bit later. But um, unlike last time, the last few times I've actually prepared a pretty massive slide pack, <laughs> um, a whole bunch of charts, charts on not just immigration but the economy, uh, you know, the labour market, um, as well as the economy and all, you know all sorts of stuff. So, that, so there's a lot of good stuff to dive into today. Um, I've come, I've come prepared. So uh, if you <laughs> like charts, it's going to be a good session. It's going to be probably a bit more like. Uh, Interviewing Tarek Brooker, so it's good. <laughs> yeah. so he, he always comes to the charts as well, so he, he sort he of certainly comes loaded. Uh, encouraged me to lift my game. Oh, very good, and no dead rat this time, right? No, no, I'm a lot more high energy than last time. So <laughs> I don't know if you, if, uh, if you watched it last time, I was a bit off, and um, I had a dead rat on the house, and I also had a cold, and I felt absolutely rotten. So uh, yeah, I'm a little, a little bit more high energy, and also the Melbourne, the, the weather in Melbourne is absolutely fantastic at the moment. So. Um, you know, after three years of soaking rain, and you were you were down here, uh, Martin. No, you, you you lived it as well. I did three um, years of now, absolute now drowning. Swinging. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's it. Well, I mean, it was you know cold and well, it was wet and miserable uh, for about three years. You know, right down the east coast, and um, you know, just today the Bureau of Meteorology uh, declared a El Nino, so mm. which basically means we're going to have a dry, hot summer. Probably we're going to have the reverse of what happened in the last three years. We're going to have drought, a bit like what we had four years ago lean into the big bushfires. Um, but in the short term, you know, it's bad news long term, but in the short term, we're enjoying absolutely spectacular weather in Melbourne, like mid-20s, sunny, beautiful. I'm actually sitting here in shorts, which in uh, mid-September is pretty wild. And um, But, yeah, it's put me in a good mood. So, uh, yeah, ready to get into it. Absolutely great. Well, let's uh, let's progress. Just as we do that, uh, one of the things I want to touch on, and we might come at it later, but there's a really interesting question that I've got is to whether, in fact, the central banks are just too reactive now. You know, they're not actually setting an agenda. They're actually reacting to what's everything that's coming in, which means, of course, that as the data changes, their reactions change. So I have a feeling that... Um, Things are not uh, not going very well for central bank territory either. So we might touch on that towards the end. But anyway, let's start with the the immigration question because for Australia in particular, you know, this immigration question is probably the biggest. It really is the biggest. And uh, the fact of the matter is that we've never seen immigration this high for so long, and the consequences are well crazy, really. 
Yeah, they are. Look, they're, they're, they're absolutely crazy, not just for the housing market, which is what we're all hearing about at the moment, the, the rental crisis, but also for the labour market and obviously, you know, the environment and the government wants to make these net zero ambitions and, um, you know, a whole bunch of areas. But, um, yeah, should we kick into the uh, – and, and actually, one thing I'll add is this isn't unique to Australia. We've got the whole Anglo countries. They're all yep. doing this at the same time. They're, so they're, basically, They're all fighting for the same people, right? And it's interesting that, <laughs> yeah. that particularly if you've got assets behind you so you can go and buy property directly, right? I mean, it's interesting. So the mix – so you've got a lot of students, but you've also got a lot of more affluent people being grabbed by New Zealand, by Canada, by Australia, even the UK to an extent. So everybody is is, is basically up in the ante trying to get a particular set of demographics. Yeah, it's crazy. So, you know, Australia's obviously got record immigration, which I'll touch on in a second, but Canada hit 1.2 million in a year uh, in, in the year to March. So mm -hmm. they had 1.2 million population growth, but basically 90 Eight percent of it, I think, was from net overseas migration. Yeah, and New Zealand uh, just last week, uh, year, to, year to July, just reported record net overseas migration as well, and as well as record population growth. So, basically, the three countries in the UK obviously reported strong immigration as well. Um, a couple oh, about three months ago. So, um, you know, all all the sort of English speaking Anglo countries are all doing the same thing at the same time, and probably with fairly similar results. I'd say I'm not so sure about the UK. You can probably talk about that, but definitely, you know, New Zealand and well, Canada especially, Canada and, New Zealand, Canada and Australia are basically on, we're, we're sort of running six months behind them. But um, yeah, it's same kind of problems, per capita recession, housing crisis in Canada, just like us, um, you know, rental crisis. Uh, you've got a sort of left, left leaning government on the nose, a bit like what's happening in Albanese, just to, you know, leading us probably by about six months. So we're all kind of headed in the same stupid direction. Um, and something you know we should have we should have not rebooted after the pandemic this way, but here we are. We've gone uh, doubled down on what didn't work the previous fifteen years. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Well, you know the, the, the definition of insanity, right? <laughs> Doing the yep. same thing, Doing the same thing over and over, a different outcome. Yeah, well, yeah, well, Australia are, are the professors of that. So, um, you know, anyway, but, but I guess we'll, we'll probably touch on it later. I mean, I, you know, the Australian Treasury's got a lot to blame blame for that one, I think. Well, I, I have this theory, <laughs> before you get into the into the charts, that actually it is the Treasury that's the real, the real problem here, right? They've got a very strong neoliberal perspective, a very distorted view of the world, and they flat, frankly influence everything, right? They're sitting in on the Reserve Bank meeting and steer it. They're obviously influencing... Um, politicians and, and government policy so actually if you want to solve the australian problem you've got to actually solve the treasury problem yeah and, and it is sort of tail, tail wagging the dog so at least on the immigration thing and I, and I know this i think i've said it in previous um ones of this I, I worked at the treasury from 2003 to 2006 and i went in there as like a you know wide eye young dude 19 uh, in uh, 2003 and um the first day when you when you went in there all the new recruits go in and you get um you have, you have your meeting with the secretary, and back then it was Ken Henry, and he indoctrinated us with this three P's, um, this three P's well-being framework is what they called it. And basically, the whole notion was Australia's well-being is is uh, determined by three key factors. So it's popular, it's productivity, participation, and, and population. So basically, you know, productivity is self-explanatory. More productivity is good, boosts living standards. High labour force participation's, you know, good. Um, except probably not so good if it means people working more when, when they don't want to, but, you know, it's overall it's good. And then the third one, which is the most controversial, which, which I think should be dropped, is population. So basically, you know, immigration um, boosts well-being. Now, unfortunately, that was in 2003, and that was before they ramped up immigration. That sort of came later in 2005. But um the government is basically, and you know, led by Treasury, is basically focused on the third P of population growth to basically power the economy and ignore the other two, really. Um, although we do have record high participation, but the the the, the main one that which counts for eighty percent of it is basically productivity, and that's where we're failing. And they've basically focused on um, on on growing the population through immigration. We've done that for nearly twenty years, and it's basically failed miserably. Um, we've all anyone who lives in <clears throat> Sydney, and Melbourne, in particular. Had seen the consequences, you know, obviously all the crush loading, been squeezed into apartments instead of houses, housing affordability issues, productivity has collapsed across the country uh, for the last, you know, productivity growth has been falling for basically two decades or since the, um, you know, mid 2000s. 
And um, we've obviously got really poor real wage growth, household income growth, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, and, and so it's been a livability disaster. And, you know, I was kind of hoping that the pandemic, when we had negative net overseas migration, the government might come out of it and say, okay, we're not going to go back to what we what we did the previous 15 years because it didn't work. We'll run a more sustainable, lower immigration policy like we did for the 60 years after the Second World War. Um you know, sort of that hundred thousand a year, hundred and twenty thousand a year, sort of around around about that level. Instead, the Albanese government's gone basically hog wild and has ramped up immigration deliberately uh, to the highest level in history. And it's probably it's probably a good segue into the charts. Do you think? Yeah, go um, for it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. Miles are brilliant. Yep. Are they uh, sh- shown on the screen? I- yep. There you go. All right, beauty. So, yeah, as I said before, I put together a bit of a chart pack and I just thought I'll take us through like the migration numbers and then impact on the housing market and then impact on the labour market and blah, blah, blah. Um, <clears throat> so basically the, the chart on the left and right basically shows the um, last week's uh, immigration and population growth numbers that came out to the March quarter from the ABS. Now, bearing in mind that the May federal budget, so we're talking, you know, what, four months ago or something, Predicted that we'd have four hundred thousand net overseas migration in the fun- in last financial year. So that's the 2022-23 financial year, and they, it, project, it predicted that we'd have five hundred twenty-four thousand population increase over the financial year. Now the data is only to <clears throat> um, the March quarter, but what it showed is that the population growth rocketed to an all-time high five hundred sixty-three thousand two hundred in the year of March. And that was driven by net overseas migration of four hundred and 54,300, which is smashed, obviously, with three months ago in the financial year, smashed the budget's projections of only a few months ago. And you can see it on the left chart there. That basically tracks Australia's net overseas migration all the way back to Federation. And um, basically, the post-war average up until it ramped up in 2005 was about 80, 85,000 net overseas migration. And... Um, we're now, you know, we've just done 454,000. And as you can see, it's absolutely off the charts. Like it's just, you know, if you thought it was big, the biggest year of immigration we had before that, I think was in 2016 when we had 260,000. That was a little spike just here. And now we've gone right up here. It's ridiculous. And then on the right-hand side, I've just basically done a sort of shorter term chart of just population growth against immigration. And again, it's the same story. The population growth basically tracks immigration. Um, you know, it's just a bit higher because because uh, natural increase. Now, the thing about it is natural increase actually is increased by immigration. So, if someone comes over here directly, you know, they, they, they hop off the plane as a as a migrant. A couple of years later, there's a good chance if they're young, they're going to have children. But that those children aren't counted as obviously as immigration; they count as as uh, natural increase. So, if you increase immigration, you also increase natural increase. Um, that's what basically grows the population base over time. Now, that's only to the March quarter. What we also got the week before, and this data is only preliminary and it's only an estimate, but we also got the national accounts for the June quarter. And according to the population numbers using that, and this chart comes from Cameron Kusher from PropTrack, who did a good job doing a great chart, and I couldn't, couldn't be bothered replicating it because it's such a good chart. And what that basically suggested was that Australia's population grew by 626,000 in the tw- in last financial year. So again, that's about 100,000 more than the May federal budget said. So we've got an absolutely booming population growth here, um, you know, led by immigration. And, um, you know, I'd argue that this immigration boom has been deliberately engineered by the Albanese government. Um, You know, it took to the Jobs and Skills Summit last year and it's done a whole bunch of other things to effectively turbocharge migration in the country, mostly through the student visa route. Um, First of all, extended post-study graduate visas by two years. So basically, if you if you finish a course and you graduate as an international student, you can now get you know pretty much four year uh, study visas pretty easily now. Previously, it was two years. Um, the government also spent forty two million and employed an extra four hundred staff, so that takes about six hundred in total to clear this contrived one million visa backlog, which they've been talking about uh, when they came in, and they've basically been rubber stamping as many visas as possible. Um, the hilarious thing about it was um, the Immigration Minister, Andrew Giles, in December said that, you know, that they'd almost halved the visa backlog. So they'd rubber stamped, you know, they got down about 600,000 in December. Well, he came out about two weeks ago and did another tweet where he said, good news, we're almost halved the visa backlog. 
we've got it down to 600,000. So effectively, it's unchanged from what it was uh, in December to now. And the reason for that is because the applications are just pouring in. They keep rubber stamping them, but they can't. They're just more and more coming in. So they're basically just rubber stamping as many approvals as they can. And they're basically using this contrived 1 million visa backlog as an excuse to just keep the pedal on the gas for immigration. So on, on top of those things, the, the federal government also raised the permanent uh, non-humanitarian migrant intake by 30,000. They're also raising humanitarian migrant intake by about uh, six or 7,000 to 20,000. They, they approved 66,000 pandemic event visas um, in their first year. So what those were, those are basically temporary visas that they handed out during the pandemic. Um, when, when migrants couldn't go home, they basically gave them these temporary visas that allowed them to work, et cetera, until the pandemic was finished. Well, the pandemic finished, the Albanese government came, in the office, came into office and they kept handing out these visas. And they basically give, give these migrants first full work rights. So they did another 66,000 of them. They, they, after media backlash, they finally shut down the rot about a month, uh, a couple of weeks ago. They've also prioritised offshore visa applications over onshore. So they basically said, if you're coming from overseas, we'll prioritise your your um, rubber stamp in your visa over whether or not over you already been here. And that was basically a way to get more people into the country. Um, they also, a few weeks ago, removed a requirement that international students uh, need to acknowledge that they're not applying for, that that, that they are not um, planning to migrate here as part of the student visa application. So previously they had to sign a declaration saying we're coming here to study not to migrate here. They got rid of that. And, and last but not least, um, the Albanese government a few months ago signed two migration uh, agreements with India, which basically allowed Indian students uh, and workers to live in Australia long term. So if you're a student and you're from India, um, you now get a five-year work visa under this agreement, and you also get an eight-year post-study work visa. Well, that's just red rag to a bull for Indian students. Um, they've also signed mutual recognition agreement, which basically says if you're educated at Indian University, your um, your qualifications are now considered that you are educated in Australia. So you basically get mutual recognition for your qualifications. So that wouldn't have had an impact yet, but that's another thing that's probably going to ramp up immigration numbers going forward. Now, in terms of what's actually driving this latest boom, it's pretty much Le Leif, let me so, just ask sorry? you a question. Your charts yep. actually aren't in projection mode. I'm not sure whether you, you intended that or whether you actually want to try and switch it into projection mode, which would make oh, the charts... Oh, yeah, I can do that if you like, for sure. Yeah, just try That's it. That's easier. See, see whether it works. Go, is that yeah, 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 yeah. That should be a lot better. So that... Sorry about that. I, I, my, yep. my computer updated to Windows 11 or 12, yep. uh, literally before I came on. Um, <laughs> and it's just, uh, yeah, it's it's the, the whole formatting is different. So I need to get used to the whole new setup. Yeah, yeah. Now that's, that's, that. that's filled the screen. It's just easier to read with uh, people. a couple of people suggesting you should try it. And it yeah. is, that's a lot better. Yeah, great. Oh, no worries. Yeah, sorry about that. Sorry. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, in terms of what's driving the, the net overseas migration, well, it's all, you know, it's pretty much international students. There are... We, we have had a big boost in work work visas as well and, um, you know, other things. But if you want to look at the, you know, if you want to put it down to a main cause, it's temporary students. So the chart on the left basically shows um, the number of temporary student uh, visas on issue. This is from the Department of Home Affairs. Um, now, that as of July, there was 654,870,000 temporary uh, student visas. And... Um, that's up by, you know, about 300,000 on what it was in June 2022. So it's basically, I'm comparing July to June. So all these figures here up to 2022 are, are June 30. And the the 2023 one's actually uh, July 31. That's just the way the data is. They do quarterly and then they give you a monthly update. Um, so, you know, that that's extreme growth. And that's basically 100,000 more. So we've now got, we've got 100,000 more uh, students in the country temporary uh, students in the country than we did pre-pandemic. Um, I should have put this chart in, but I didn't. There's also, um, we've also had, had an increase of 100,000 in um, temporary graduate visas. So temporary graduate visas were about 90,000 um, June 30 last year. They're now 190,000. So we've had a big, in so about basically we've got about 850,000 people in Australia right now who are either on a temporary student visa or a temporary graduate visa. Mm -hmm. So that's uh one in 30 one in 30 Australians yeah, and Leif, uh, on one of those visas. And I, am I right in thinking now it's also easier once you're in Australia on that visa, it's such easier then to actually get permanent residency, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it's not just oh, for sure. an access to education 
it's an access to Australia and potentially Australia long term. That's right. Yeah, and, and and the thing about it is, you know, if, if you're on a graduate visa, you're you, you can stay here for four years, or if you're from India now, according to this agreement, eight years. Yeah. And you know, even if you don't qualify for permanent residency, because those those numbers are supposed to be capped, um, you can probably switch to another visa, and you can end up staying here for you know a decade, maybe. Yeah. Uh, and then eventually, you'll probably end up with permanent residency. So you so you're going to end up you know here for a long, long time. Um. So you know, for all intents and purposes, it's a long term residency visa. Yeah. Um, now, the, I'm sorry, the chart just, on the right. Just, just one other point quickly. The other reason why this is important is because the education system, you know, particularly at university level, completely relies on international students, right? So not only is this actually supporting, um, you know, bigger population, but it's actually supporting the education system because without it, the costs will be uh, prohibitively high and the um, university system would collapse. That, oh, hundred percent. It's um, look. Th th this is, you know, I could I could wax lyrical about this all day, but also <laughs> um, one of the, one of the problems with this is that the Australian Bureau of Statistics measures student exports wrong. Mm. So basically, um, you know, if, you, you've probably heard this this forty billion dollar international education export figure that getting bandied around. Now, it's been banned around for years. It's actually gone up to forty-six million uh, billion, so it's now you know so-called record. The way they measure that, and this has been proven, um, I think I mentioned it last time. Basically, that export figure, effectively, if you're on a student visa, what it does is it automatically uh, counts all of your spending, whether you work in a job here, earn income, and then spend that. Um, it counts that as an export. So, for example, if you're Someone from, say, India or Nepal, you come over here with a couple thousand bucks with your plane ticket, you know, a few weeks accommodation, whatever, to study in a, you know, vocational education hairdressing course or something. You come over here with nothing. You autom you start work straight away because they have basically, you know, work rights. So you start doing whatever um, to, to earn a crust. Um, you pretty much, all your income is coming from employment income, just like me and, you know, whoever else who lives in Australia. And then if you pay rent, you pay for your course fees, you pay for your living expenses. Under the, the way the ABS does it, they count that as an export, which is absolutely farcical because most students that, that come here, um, China is the one exception where less of them work. But pretty much everyone else, you know, majority of them, or overall, overall majority of these students work while they're in Australia. And all that expenditure from that income earned in Australia is counted as an export, which is farcical. Yep. So basically, if I if I change my um, designation as a, instead of being an Australian, you know, citizen, permanent resident, whatever, if I change my designation to an international student, all the income I earn doing macro business and everything else would suddenly be counted as an export under yep. the ABS's definition, which is farcical. Um, but unfortunately, what it does is it basically makes this sector sound really valuable to Australia. You know, it's like it gives Australia this valuable export income, supposedly. And then the government then, it, so, so it gives the whole um, education industry, the university, et cetera, more lobbying clout. And then the government's basically pandered to them by basically opening up all these migration pathways to get more students in to increase this mythical export number, which isn't really an export. Uh, it's a complete farce. But that's basically, you know, so so it's a classic case of the universities and higher education providers prioritising the gains from this immigration while the costs are socialised and the rest of us, you know, through the rental market and all this other stuff. Um, you know, it's it's, it's crazy. But um, there's and another but, chart, but, chart on the right. Yeah, sorry to forget that the chart. And just to make, just to complete that picture, what that means is that the so-called trade surplus, you know, on the positive trade balance is being supported by an economic principle that actually is incorrect. That's yeah, actually what it means. it's statistical trickery. Correct, yeah. It's complete statistical trickery. Now, the thing about it is, it's like, you know, um, a tourist that comes over, that, that's a genuine export mm. in most almost all circumstances, except, I mean, I guess working holiday maker, I'm not sure how they count that while they're working, but, you know, most, most tourists come here, though, you know, if you are come from America, for example, um, to to attend the, you know, the, the Soccer World Cup, the Women's Soccer World Cup, you earn your money in America, you hop on a plane, you bring over a bunch load of savings, you spend on hotels, whatever, you know, and then you go home. But that money was earned in America and then spent in Australia. So that's an export. Instead, with the students, they come over here with not much. Then they work and they live here long term. And 
what they spend is pretty much earned in Australia, but mm. then get it. That's all counted as an export. It's complete farce. <laughs> um, but that's that's basically the statistical trickery that's basically underpinning the whole scam. Yeah, and then you know. And then the government likes to tout how important it is, and now it's our third biggest export behind iron ore and you know coal and whatever. When really it's not. It's not at all. Um, you know, it's all just it's all just economic activity like you or me. You know. Yeah. Anyway, the um so so the chart on the right. This is so this is so the one on the left was Home Affairs. The one on the right is uh, the ABS, and they do monthly visa arrivals data, and that basically shows that um, <clears throat> a record two hundred ninety four thousand uh, net student visa arrivals, uh, you know, um, net students arrived in Australia in the end of July, and that drove a five hundred three thousand increase in net visa arrivals. So. Again, you know, whether the data matches up perfectly or not doesn't really matter. It just basically gives you the figure that we've got record numbers of student visa arrivals right now. And um, that's basically what's driving, what what has driven this record surge in net overseas migration. There is other stuff like the um, net um, uh, people on employment visas also went up by 250,000. So that was a lot. But the main driver is the temporary student visas. Now, you know, you don't have to be rocket scientists to know this is having a massive impact on the housing market. So the um, so the chart on the left basically tracks Australia's population growth. You can see the massive uptick in 2005 when basically this whole immigration rocket took off uh, against dwelling, comp- dwelling completions, which is the blue line. And pretty much, you know, immigration ra- ramped up about 10 years before we got a supply response. And we had a sort of supply response for about seven or eight years. Uh, last decade, where we built a record number of homes, but now that's that's um, that's come off. At the same time, we've got this absolutely extreme, unprecedented record immigration, and the impact of it is shown on the right. And this chart comes from Shane Oliver, who put it up last week. Uh, fantastic chart, and basically it shows that the rental vacancy rates collapsed to its all-time low, whilst we've got double-digit rental growth across the capital cities. Now, um, you know we all know this. Uh, we've Anyone who lives in Australia has been hearing about the rental crisis for the last, you know, last year, year pretty much. Uh, you see all the reports of rents rocketing, uh, people having to move into group housing, increasing homelessness, and whatever. This is the primary cause of that has been the federal government, it's been the Albanese government Do, doing all these measures and deliberately ramping up immigration to levels we've never seen before. It's absolutely atrocious for um, you know for equity and that sort of stuff. Of course. Uh, it's also helped to obviously support house prices. So despite the fact that, um, according to CoreLogic, the house prices bottomed out on the 7th of February. This is according to the Daily Index. And, and after that, we actually got a 100 basis point rise in um, the cash rate and mortgage rates. But because of this huge immigration, the rental prices, et cetera, that's driven driven a uh, 7% bounce in, um, in house prices across the five major capitals. And that's been led by Sydney and Brisbane. Um, Sydney's now slowing, Brisbane's now accelerating, but pretty much all the capitals have rebounded. And this has primarily been caused by the whole, you know, unprecedented rise in immigration. And um, the rent, you know, obviously the shortage of supply and the, it's created FOMO because people are basically, they don't want to rent because rents are rocketing at double digit rates and it's horrible and they don't know if they're about to get another rental. And it's just created this FOMO in the market. And, um, Pretty much the only person that, as I, that I know that actually picked this was um, was uh, Stephen Kukoulos, the kook. I thought it was crazy at the time, but he he sort of picked this last year, and to his credit, he's got it right. So, and um, yeah, extraordinary circumstance. You don't usually see house price rebounds happen when you had tightening monetary policy, and obviously a you know pretty severe uh, contraction in borrowing capacity. But here we are, absolutely absurd, abnormal market. Um, you know. Surge in rents and rising prices, thanks to Albo's mass immigration. And Sorry. the other impact, obviously, is on the labour market. Yep. So, um, you know, the jobs market. So, what I've got on the left is um, this is from the monthly a- uh, ABS labour force release, and effectively, the labour supply because of this extreme immigration is basically grown at twice the pace that it was um, pre-pandemic. Um, so, you know, it obviously fell. Uh, the, lab- the labor supply growth shrunk almost to nothing during the pandemic when the when we had negative net overseas migration. And now they've come back. It's it's stronger than ever. It's grown at an absolutely absurd rate. And the chart on the right actually shows that we've almost caught up on the lost immigration from the pandemic. 
Um, so the the green line there shows the uh, pre-COVID trend and basically what the population, what the civilian population aged over fifteen would have would would have been without the pandemic. It just grew at the previous pre-pandemic rate. And as you can see, we fell way behind that. And now we've just about caught up and probably in a month or two, we're going to be level and then we're going to surpass it. Yeah. And one of the questions with regard to these sorts of numbers, which I come to, is that we've got more people working multiple jobs. You saw that in the most recent data, right? Uh, and, okay. you know, you can make a couple of arguments. The first argument is, well, a lot of those jobs are additional part-time jobs, so people are effectively having to work more hours to try and actually get by. Even the RBA in their um, notes today from the minutes last night, last time admitted that households are getting more households are getting a difficulty, right? So one of the things that people can do is to end up with working more jobs. So we're seeing more multiple jobs. Um, and we're also seeing more hours being worked as well. So people are chasing their tails, trying to work, work harder and faster. So... One of the interesting questions to me is to what extent this is also being driven by the economic problem that many households have, as well as more people coming into the country and, and creating more, more jobs, right? Because the net 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 is that people are having to work a lot harder, work a lot longer just to get by in the context where, in fact, productivity is falling, in the context where real incomes aren't actually growing as strongly as they were, so the economic dials are just off the charts in my mind. Oh, 100%. And, and you've also obviously got, um, you know, the the ABS uh, latest cost of living indexed um, to, the, to the June quarter showed that mortgage interest has gone up basically, you know, nearly doubled mm. in, the, in the year to June. Mm. Uh, so you've got households getting squeezed by obviously rising energy prices, rising rents. If you've got a mortgage, you, your mortgage repayments are rocketed. Um, they've effectively got negative real wage growth. Yeah. And they've had it for you know the last year or so. So effectively, you got to work more just to um, you know give yourself the same standard of living, uh, or to cover your you know your, your rising costs. So, um, and that's why I've got one of the reasons why I've got this you know increased uh, multiple job holders are now at record highs because uh, households are getting squeezed. Mm. But, well, but that, the scary but that, thing about it is, oh, sorry, go on. So what that means is, but though that. You as a, an Australian already in Australia trying to perhaps get more hours, you're now competing with all of these other people who are also coming into the country. And some of those people coming to the country seem to be more willing to work for less. Oh, so, 100%, especially so it dampens. Yeah, especially given our major, major Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and our major our major uh, source of students um, mm. is, you know, India, Nepal, uh, Pakistan, places like that, like very, very poor, poor uh, poor nations obviously where where people they're not coming over with a lot um they're, they're not rich students they're coming over with not a lot in their back and they got to basically you know do these sorts of jobs and and um you know it, it, i guess it's been covered up a bit by the sort of we, we had a, a pipeline of unfilled jobs over the pandemic so when the government ramped up stimulus then we also had obviously negative net overseas migration um we had a whole bunch of unfilled jobs. Now that pipeline is shrinking. And in fact, this is sort of shown in the next chart on the left-hand side. We've got the Seek Employment data, which came out actually today um, for August. And basically, you can see that the uh, the job ads is falling. It's still, you know, elevated. But the bigger factor there, and this is the more important one, is actually the blue line here. And that shows the, the number of applications per job. So effectively, the... Job ads are, are falling at the same time as we have this record labour supply growth. And what this has done is it's actually sent the applications per job uh, to to above its pre-pandemic level. So now it's so in, in some ways this is showing that the labour market's actually looser than it was pre-pandemic because we've got this huge labour supply response at the same time as the economy is now slowing because of the RBA rate hikes and all the other stuff. Um, and that's a pretty bad harbinger of what's to come. And this chart on the right's been done by um, CBA and it effectively shows that the economy's got to create around 35,000 jobs per month just to keep the unemployment rate constant, you know, to, to stop it from rising given a, you know, constant participation rate. So we've got a situation where the, the economy's got to produce a hell of a lot of jobs just to soak up the migrants coming to Australia. And, you know, with the economy slowing, that seems incredibly unlikely. And it sort of tells you that unemployment's going to going to rise, and 
In fact, Roy Morgan's estimate of unemployment, um, which is you know a bit, bit looser than the ABS, but they generally track each other, uh, showed that unemployment rocketed to 11% in August, which was its highest level since March 2021. And Roy Morgan pinned that on basically this record labour supply growth uh, because of immigration outpacing jobs growth. And you can see from the table here, which compares August 2023 to 2022, we've had this, you know, the population age 14 plus has gone up 706,000 during the year, which is massive, primarily because of immigration, but also because of Costello's baby bonus kids are now hitting working age. Um, and that's, and basically the workforce has grown by nearly half a million, but we only created 161,000 jobs. Now in a normal year, 161,000 jobs is pretty damn good. You go, you know, that, that, that's a solid year, but it's not solid when you've got the, the labor force growing so ferociously because of this mass immigration. And, you know, thankfully most of that's put, uh, been full time, but it's still not nearly enough. And as a result, the number of unemployed has gone up nearly 2%. And the unemployment's also gone up 0.2%, so according to Roy Morgan. <clears throat> and this this should, you know, it hasn't yet, it hasn't yet hit the ABS's, um, you know, measure of unemployment, but it should because the chart on the right here, and, and this was done by um, Justin Farber at Macquarie Bank, he charted basically uh, this blue line, which I showed you applications per job, against the official ABS unemployment rate. It's a pretty good leading indicator. Uh, of, of where the unemployment rate's going to go. And as you can see, it looks like it's going to shoot up. Um, the RBA tipped that Australia's unemployment rate hit 4.5% by late next year. But, you know, that seems pretty optimistic, I think, based on these immigration numbers that we're getting. Um, right. And just one so quick that, point. The quality of jobs is also important to understand, right? So if you look at the growth in jobs across the in different industry groups, the biggest is actually in health care and allied services and sort of health support so it's actually to do with um, a particular sector of the economy where in fact wages are relatively low for a lot of people that work in the sector you know a lot of part-time carers and helpers so you know i've i've used the term previously the bedpan economy right because what we're doing is <laughs> the growth is not the necessarily growth is in the healthcare and caring yeah, sector. yeah 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 which is i mean it's an important stuff it needs to be done but it doesn't actually necessarily create more value for the economy, right? It, it's no. effectively a services sector, and the services sector doesn't necessarily, it just moves the dollar about. It doesn't actually create more dollars. So not only have you got this, this problem with people needing to work more jobs just to get by, the mix of the jobs is actually to those that are actually important. Yes, Low but, but yeah. So, so, I mean, the more you look at this, the, you, the more you think this economy is stuffed. Yeah, and it's and, and effectively, um, you know, you always hear the excuse, "Oh, I've got to, we've got to run big, biggest, big immigration program because we've got skill shortages." But the ridiculous thing is, Australia's population has grown by seven point four million people this century, um, through primarily through this massive immigration that we've had. Um, now that's we you know we've never seen growth like that before. That that's a hell of a lot of growth in you know 20, 23 years effectively, and it hasn't solved the skills shortage. Like the the the, the federal government in two thousand two, the under the Howard government, they did a uh, parliamentary inquiry into skills, and you had all the same players: the Business Council, the Australian uh, the Chamber of Commerce, Australian Industry Group, all those all the usual you know rent seekers from the business lobby basically said in 2002 that Australia's got an aging population, we've got labour shortages, we need to import a whole bunch of migrants. Well, guess what? They got their wish and we've had the biggest immigration boom over the, you know, since 2005 that the nation's ever had. And we've got worse skill shortages than ever. And all this tells you is that it doesn't work. Mm. And the reason why it doesn't work is pretty simple. Uh, you, know, you can solve one problem. For example, at the moment we've got um, you know, this massive housing shortage. The federal government says they want to build 1.2 million homes over five years. You've got Buckley's chance of actually doing it. But, you know, we've got labour shortages, material shortages, all that. But, okay, let, let's just say we imported a million migrants and they're all builders, right? So we can build more houses. Okay, forget the material side, the land availability, all that. But let's just say, okay, that solves that problem. That's great. You solve one problem. Problem is those million migrants you bring in are going to have children who are going to need schools. They're going to need hospitals. They're going to need road space. 
They're going to need all the other stuff that you know people need um, when when you have population growth, all the people servicing, all the infrastructure, everything that go with it. So you're just going to create all these shortages in other areas. So the solution then is, oh, I've got to bring bring a whole bunch of nurses and doctors to go and fill the the hospital and medical shortage that you've created. So we do that. And then you, oh, we need dentists. Okay, so import them. So you import all these people and then it just creates, and then you're back to having a housing shortage because you've imported all these millions of people to cover the, the migrants that arrived last year. And that's effectively what we've been doing for 20 years. We've just been trying to band-aid over, create, uh, um, solving a shortage here and a shortage there and whatever. And, you know, and it's just created shortages in other areas and we've never actually solved the problem. Um, and that's that's basically the Australian economy. And the, the solution is always just to have more immigration. It just creates more problems than it solves. It's just uh, it's bonkers. Mm. And, and it's worth saying, of course, the high immigration, um, which is supported by Treasury, also supported by big business, right? Because big business want more people to sell stuff to if you're actually in, in, that, in that end of the market or you need more people to work in, in your business and you don't want to pay full wages, you want to pay lower wages. So there's a huge lobby in favour of this big Australia, you know, big economy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, oh, but it's interesting. Understand. Always follow the money. And anybody on the other side of the argument gets um, pilloried as racist or something similar, right? And uh, I mean, even Tarek Brooker, who I would regard yeah. as a, one of the straight most- Straight shooter. Yeah, straight shooter and, and just calls the data the data and has been hit quite hard on Twitter recently because he actually called it out. So anybody who's on the other was, side of the argument. Yeah, so, you know, anyone is, if you want to go to macro business today, I actually slammed, um, you know, Dr. Demography Professor Liz Allen, who's a calls herself a demographer, but it's just really a shill. The <laughs> big Australia. She she basically had a go at Tarek Brooker, who's a you know bloody legend, quite frankly. But he's um you know he's a, he's he's, he's an honest guy, right? He's an independent. Like there's not many ind truly independent economists out there, and he's one of them. Most of them are paid chills for some sort of industry, or you know they they they, they work in some uh, lobbying capacity, some sort. You know they're they're paid from a you know, they work for the business council, whatever they paid for them, so they got to talk to the company line, etc. Tarek's not one of those people. And he wrote a very straightforward, factual, I don't know how you can fold him on it, because I read the whole thing and I was like, where's, where's the issue with this? Yeah. Oh, and basically he said, here's what the 2002 intergenerational report had for GDP per capita growth, for population growth, and here's what we got instead. Yeah. And he basically said that we hit the 20, 2050 population target about 28 years early. Um, we, and he didn't even say because they ran out of me. He just basically did a factual thing. And this doctor of demography, Liz Allen person, basically um, said that, you know, the article's a disgrace. People shouldn't, you know, uh, the media should not report these things unless they 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 first talk to a demographer like her. Well, you know, basically gatekeeping the discussion. And it was, you know, bloody poor form. And luckily, you know, about 50 people came out and slammed her for it and just said, what do you, what, what do you, you know, say, say why he was wrong and argue the point. Don't go ad hominem, which is what she did. Yep. And, you know, mate, I've copped this over and over again. Abel Rizvi, he's a, he's another one of these guys who just calls me racist, calls me whatever, um, has attacked me for years. And guess what? He's always wrong. <laughs> he's, he's always wrong on this stuff. Um, and I've just been, so I've been hitting back, punching him back um, the last few weeks, just, you know, picking apart his arguments because he's, he's he's another one of these guys who wants to gatekeep the discussion and basically talks down to anyone who wants to talk about these numbers factually. Um, you know, so Tarek copped it. I've been copping it for years and it's a, it's a disgrace. We should be able to talk openly about this stuff. I don't see what is racist about talking about immigration numbers. Hmm. Um, immigration is the everything issue. It's one of the reasons why I've got a bloody housing shortage. Uh, we're not attacking migrants, we're, we're attacking excessive levels of immigration, which is basically what the government is doing. And this hurts the migrants the most. They, end, they, they, they actually tend to be, um, you know, people who, who are obviously poorer because they've come, they don't have, you know, family wealth, they haven't been here for long enough. They tend to come over here with not much. And they're the ones who get displaced the most when you run these huge immigration programs. So, um, you know, the whole thing is just a farce. We should be allowed to talk openly about this stuff. Um, and, you know, I've been on it for years and I've been copying it, Tarot copped it. It's not good enough. It shouldn't happen. Oh, I agree. Well, anyway, you know, one, yeah, of the, one of the reasons why DFA is here is to try and have these debates because the mainstream doesn't want to have them. Um, the other point... Well, of well, 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 they don't want to have it because they're losing and, <laughs> and they're losing the narrative. And, and, and people like Tarek and I live rent-free in their heads. 
because they don't <laughs> want smart people to actually question this stuff and actually have the data to back it up. Yes. So they're scared. So the easiest thing to do is just call someone racist mm. and to try and shut down debate. And that's what they've been, you know, trying to do effectively. Um, you know, playing the race card. Um or, you know, playing or, or deferring to authority. You know, you don't have the authority to talk on this. You're not a demographer. Um, you know, this sort of thing. So, it, 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 you know, Liz Allen basically used the vibe. Was, it was her whole argument, whereas Tarek actually used hard fact and numbers. Exactly. And anyway, she went off the wrong target, basically. Yeah. And I'll make one other quick point. You, you mentioned the, the migrants being, you know, caught in the crosshairs here. One of the interesting observations in my survey, I still run the surveys, rental stress is highest amongst first-generation Australians. So in other words, those new migrants have have basically paid top dollar to get into a rental, and now they're struggling, right? So the rental stress is higher there than anywhere else across the various segments. Yeah, and, and, and they'd also probably struggle the most for pay the mortgages because there's no bank and mum and dad for them. Correct. Um, so, you know, if you want to talk about, you know, um, helping migrants, well, don't make them compete so hard by, you know, basically flooding the place with record numbers. I mean, we would not be having this discussion if the federal government in 2005 had not gone from this, which was sort of the normal levels, to this. Hmm. We wouldn't even be having this discussion. It, it wouldn't be a problem. And problem is they decided to just ramp it up for no reason. It was never taken to the Australian people are going to do this. And we've seen the results. We've all lived through it for the last nearly 20 years. Like we all we all know it's not working. It's obvious it's not working. Mm. But you know, but we're but we're now we're, but we're not allowed to talk about it. Like it's just insane. Like, you know, we've got a we've got a we've got the worst housing crisis in living memory in generations right now. But we're but we're not allowed to mention immigration. It's not oh, it's not the cause. Of course it's the bloody cause. You can't you can't grow the population by nearly six hundred and thirty thousand people in a year. And not expect there to be major stress on the housing market, especially when you've got builders falling over left and right. You've got high materials costs. You know, you've got all this other stuff. Of course, it's creating the problem. And, you know, don't run it so hot. Like, we shouldn't have even gone back to the, the old model after COVID, let alone doubled down on it and gone bigger than ever, which is basically what this Albanese government's done. Yeah. They, never, they didn't take this to the Australian people. They actually said in December 2021, Alvo said that he wouldn't necessarily support the Morrison government's 160,000 permanent migrant intake because um, he said we should be training Australians instead. Well, guess what, mate? You, you, you've raised that to 190, plus you've just brought in all these temporaries. So, you know, he, he effectively said that he was going to potentially run a lower immigration program, and he's done the opposite. So he's basically lied to us as well. So, you know, come on. We, we, we're going to keep talking about it. more and more people are talking about it. And this is why, you know, Abel Rizvi and, um, you know, Liz Allen and all and all their cronies are basically spitting the dummy because they're losing the narrative because everyone's talking about this now. Mm. And, 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 you know, the emperor has no clothes. And I come back to my yeah, point right. I made but, earlier on to, uh, that, that a lot of this is driven off the treasury um, ideology, right? Because effectively they are in, you know, independent of the two sides of politics and so never mind who gets in you know this treasury mantra that you discussed earlier on which is pull the lever pull the lever pull the lever right irrespective of the consequences is actually where the root cause of the problem lies yeah and and, and just on that there's you know one of the reasons for that is the the treasury cares about the federal budget hmm. right so i've talked about this previously we've got this vertical fiscal imbalance in australia where basically 80 percent of the tax revenues are raised by the federal government and the states and uh, local governments take the rest. And what this means, the problem with it is, is that you know, treasure, uh, the federal government collects all the income tax and they collect all the company tax. And for them, immigration is fantastic. It's great for the federal budget. Um, you know, we saw it in the last federal budget. So, um, you know, the reason why it's great is obviously you bring in a whole bunch of people. Uh, they obviously, most of them work, so they pay income tax. And you end up with a whole bunch of extra income tax receipts uh, through population growth as well. They boost company profits, so you get more company corporate tax receipts. So for the federal budget, it's great. Problem is, the cost of of uh, high pop the cost of population growth, whether it's um, you know infrastructure, social housing, services, 
So, you know, nurses, doctors, and all that sort of stuff. That's all, that's pretty much all funded by the state governments. So the state governments are the primary, primarily responsible for service delivery and infrastructure. They cop it in the neck in this high immigration because they don't get the, they don't get much of the revenue gains. They get a little bit through, you know, obviously stamp duty, et cetera, because it props up the property prices. But the lion's share of the income tax, well, the, the tax revenue goes to the federal government, but most of the costs go to the state government. So you've got this kind of, um, you know, problem with incentives there. Um, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, Victoria and New South Wales in particular are absolutely drowning in debt right now because they've tried to, the last sort of 10 years, they've, tried, they've basically flogged off everything they can that's not bolted down and they privatised everything to try and get some quick money in the door. They've also invested in all these hideously expensive infrastructure projects, which, you know, when you grow so quickly in cities like the city of Melbourne that are already built out, you have effectively have to retrofit your infrastructure. And that's incredibly expensive. So if you want to build a new road, because there's no more land available, you've got to basically do a tunnel. Tunnels cost, you know, up to a million dollars a kilometre. Uh, sorry, a billion dollars a kilometre. And, um, you know, in some cases. So your infrastructure is hideously expensive. And the way they've tried to get around it is in all these public-private partnerships. So, you know, you've got all these corporations like Transurban now, fleecing us. Um, you know, you try, I've said this last time, you try and drive around Sydney now, you get stung with a toll road anywhere you go because there's just toll roads everywhere. Um you know, so one of the problems is Treasury doesn't account for those costs because the costs don't fall on its ledger, but it gets all the gains through the extra tax revenue. So it's another reason why it always supports this big Australia stuff. Um, it also allows the government to claim that the, the, the economy is not in recession when it really is in recession. That's And that's the point of these charts here. Um, you know, the, the national accounts were released two weeks ago and they showed that Australia's real, real GDP per capita fell for two consecutive quarters. So we had, we're basically in a per capita recession. And what that basically means is the, the economic, the overall economic pie is growing slightly. So we got, I think, 0.4% um, GDP growth in the June quarter. But because the population grew by 0.7%, there is huge immigration, um, the pie is growing, but everyone's share of the pie is actually shrinking. And it's shrunk for two consecutive quarters. And you'll see in that chart on the left, we've had heaps of per capita recessions. Or you know negative quarters of per capita GDP over the past you know e even during Australia's miracle where we went seventeen years or whatever it was without a recession we actually did have them it's just that they were uh, they were papered over by this huge population growth in Australia and the thing the thing driving the uh, per capita recession is we've had a you know quite a decent well we had a fall in um, in uh, real household disposable income per capita so you know. Household consumption is the main driver of the economy. It accounts for about 55% of growth in a given quarter on average. Uh, so usually where, as the middle chart shows, where household consumption goes, the economy usually follows, and now it's falling. And I put a chart on the right, and this basically shows the long-run you know, trend um, GDP per capita growth, and it's been really poor for, for years, and pretty much over this whole big Australia migration period, it's been falling. Um, like, it was pretty, it was good in the early to mid 2000s we had the mining boom um the mining investment boom etc where they built put all the you know huge mining investment and that sort of propped up growth but you know pretty much post that we've had this really terrible gdp per capita growth and it's pretty much been sort of hovering around close to these recessionary levels for a long time and basically the economy kept has kept growing because they've been running such high population growth through immigration but effectively everyone's share of the pie is barely growing and right now it's actually falling um and, and households in particular are getting smashed. So, you know, the chart on the left shows real household disposable income per capita from the national accounts. And we had we had a boost over the pandemic when the government's showers were stimulus effectively. Um, but now it's, you know, it's fallen back down. And we had the biggest one year fall in household disposable income in the year to June where it fell 5.1%. Now, real household disposable income is now tracking at 2019 levels. And the chart on the right comes from the wage price index, and that's and that's basically shows that real wages now have totally collapsed um, through you know obviously lower than what should be wage growth as well as obviously high inflation. And effectively, real wages are now tracking at two thousand nine levels. Um, so we've got this situation where basically households are getting absolutely you know wrecked at the moment, and that's basically what's driving this per capita recession. And there doesn't seem to be you know much of much. Uh, light on the horizon right now. And just one last point. Um, these living standards are going to keep falling under this ridiculous policy we've got. So 
you know, just yesterday, that's the little snippet on the left. Um, the Albanese government announced that it's going to cut funding for infrastructure projects and cut infrastructure projects. Um, it's basically going to delay or axe $33 billion worth of projects. And this is coming at the same time as it's obviously running the biggest population growth slash immigration program in the nation's history. So, you know, we need infrastructure more now than ever to if we're going to keep up with this huge population growth. And yet you've got the federal government planning to cut it. So all that means is we're going to get more congestion, which means lower living standards. Um, at the same time, just today, the it was it was announced by the Bureau of Meteorology that basically we're going to head into a period of El Nino, which is the opposite of what we had the last three years, which means we're going to have a hot, dry summer and probably years of hot, dry weather, uh, the reverse of what we had three years. And it was only four years ago um, as we headed into the, you know, the Black Saturday fires, that Sydney's water supply was tracking at around 20%, uh, you know, after a, about a four-year period of, you know, drought conditions. What's going to happen next time, say in four years' time, when the population has grown by millions under this extreme immigration policy? What do you think is going to happen to the water supply? And what's going to happen to the water supply in 40 years when the intergeneration report says we're going to grow by 14.2 million people. We're going to add a Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane and Adelaide in 40 years, according to, according to the intergeneration report. What are we going to do then with climate change and you know more droughts and that sort of stuff? Where are we going to get the water from? The whole thing doesn't add up. And then the other question is, how are we going to achieve net zero? So the government's committed to achieving net zero by 2050. Uh, I mean, the, apart from the fact that it's never going to happen anyway, because it's a bit of a farce, but... How are we going to achieve this net zero when the population is predicted to rise by over 50% over that 40-year period? So we're going to have 14.2 million extra consumers of energy, extra consumers, you know, creating waste, more cars, more white goods, more electric, you know, more TVs and everything. All this stuff requires energy, requires um, resources, going to create emissions. How are we going to achieve this, this mythical net zero? It's an absolute farce. It's impossible. And finally, the graphic on the right comes from the Australian State of the uh, State of the Environment report. Now, what that is, that's released every five years, and that's basically the intergeneration report for the environment. And what that said is that um, that population growth has a very high impact on the environment. That's this right here. It's got the biggest impact. Well, of course it does. If you're going to have more people, you're going to have to do more land clearing. You're going to have more waste. You're going to have more resource use. You're going to have more pollution. All this sort of stuff. How are we going to safeguard the environment with an extra 14.2 million people in 40 years, as predicted by the Intergeneration Report? Like these are all, you know, things that the federal government never considers. The Australian Treasury never considers when it runs these ridiculously large immigration programs. And you know what it basically means is that. We're going to have lower living standards. We're all going to see it in the housing market. Like our kids and grandkids are not going to be living in detached houses. Most of them aren't. They're going to be living in, you know, shoebox apartments. And they're probably, a lot of them are going to be renting instead of owning them, unlike, you know, their parents and grandparents. This is all a direct attack on our quality of life. And the federal government is effectively doing this deliberately by running these extreme immigration levels and ensuring that demand forever outpaces supply and outpaces the economy's um, basically carrying capacity. It's a joke. And uh, just one last thing. I just did some uh, rando charts. Um, wasn't sure I was going to use them, but uh, just on the whole water issue. So this this chart on the right here um, was some estimates of the cost of different forms of water supply. And you can see that it's got one desalination plant here, uh, the one faggy one in uh, Victoria. But basically the cost of desalination is, um, you know, about five times as much as traditional dam water, and even water recycling is uh, is uh, you know about four or four or so times as much as traditional dam water. So, effectively, if we're going to cater to these mass population increase, we're going to have to build a whole bunch of desal plants. And what this is what this means, and this chart here in the middle is from um, Infrastructure Australia 2017, and it tipped that real water prices for households are going to basically rise fourfold from you know, 2017 up to 2067. So again, this is another attack on your quality of life. We're going to bring in all these people during climate change. You have to build a whole bunch of energy guzzling and expensive desalination plants that's going to push up water bills 
astronomically, which is going to obviously hurt household budgets. Um, and how are we going to get water to, say, Western Sydney, you know, up to 50 kilometres away from the ocean? We're going to somehow have to build these pipelines from the desal plants on the coast and pump the water uphill against gravity, uses a lot of energy to somehow, you know, provide water to the fast, some of the fastest growing areas of Australia where a lot of the migrants go to. It doesn't work. And none of this stuff is considered by policymakers or the big Australia shields, Abel Rizvi, you know, Liz Allen, all those people. None of these costs are, are considered. And it's just, you know, it, it, it's about time we start talking about this stuff, which is, I uh, guess, what we're doing here, Martin. I'm sorry I'm in a very ranty mood tonight. Um, That's good. Keep, keep ranting. But, I mean, this, uh, is, this is important stuff, right? And it doesn't get enough of an airing because everyone's worried about, well, is inflation going to go up or down or whatever, you know, or what's happening in this China. This is long-term stuff. But, but these questions are the fundamental questions because they come actually to what sort of Australia do we want? What sort of Australia are we going to get? How big a gap is there between what we want and what we're going to get? And the truth is it's been messed over, right? And basically this massive population boom that we're talking about is going to reduce the living standards for everybody in the country. And it's going to make it harder for people to actually get ahead. It's going to actually force a lot of people to move further out. So if you look at where a lot of the growth in populations, it's, you know, Western Sydney or whatever, well, which, by the way, there's no infrastructure at all out there, you know. So, so what we've actually done is we've reduced the standard of living and we are accepting compromises in terms of building up higher and building smaller and all those things because housing affordability is off the scale. The point is... This isn't a happenstance. There's a series of settings and policies and strategies that have been in place for the last 20 to 30 years, which have created this monster. And yet, almost everybody in the sort of the mainstream conversation ignores it and just talks about the things that are, um, you know, of more immediate impact. These are critical questions, Leith, really critical questions. Oh, 100%. And, and you know, th this is why I always call uh, immigration the everything issue. Because it affects it affects pretty much most aspects of your quality of life. You know, it it affects whether or not you can afford to live in a house, or you have to be live in a shoebox apartment. Whether you can ever actually own a house, or you're forced to rent it. Um, you know, it affects obviously how long you spend stuck in traffic. It it it, it impacts whether or not you can find a seat on a train or on a bus. Uh, whether or not there's you know you can find a spot at a park or a sporting field. Um, whether or not you know you can water your garden because there's if you if you're lucky enough to have a garden, um, you know because there's water shortages etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Like it's just everything and and also you're obviously uh, how much smog's in the air, um, all sorts of stuff, and and uh, you know it, it's basically the everything issue. Yet some people don't want us to talk about it, and we should be talking about it because we have deliberately gone down the road of doing this this year the last 20 20 years we went from normal you know sustainable whatever you could easily plan for it we could build enough houses it was good moderate growth under these sorts of net overseas migration things in 2002 the, the 2002 intergenerational report um basically forecast or projected that australia's population would be its current size what it is now 26.4 million by 2050, right? That was under net overseas migration, it was assumed to be 90,000 a year, which was basically the post-war average. It was actually a little bit above the post-war average, but basically this red line. Um, so, you know, if we'd done this for the last 20 years, we would not hit our current population until 2050. And we wouldn't be having these housing shortages. And we wouldn't be having this, we wouldn't even be here talking about it right now. We'd just be like, yeah, it'd be all be cool. You know, cities be growing at a graduate pace. We, we provide enough infrastructure, all that sort of stuff. Instead, they just, they just started to ramp it, ramp it to these sorts of levels. And as a result, we've hit this population, you know, um, projection from the from 2022, sorry, 2002, 28 years early. And now by 2050, you know, our population, well, by 2063, our population's, um, you know, tipped to be uh, over 40 million people. And it's like, well, you know, what are we doing here? Like, what, why, why do we have to run it so hard? Why are we doing this? It's just, it's been thrust upon us because, you know, somehow talking about this stuff 
you're not allowed to talk about it because if you talk about it, you're a racist. And that's basically the excuse. It's like, oh, you must not talk about it. And the House of Crosses has nothing to do with this. It's because of, you know, poor government policy. Well, the poor government policy is doing this. Like, you know, the fact of the matter is we have... We had a the the biggest ever housing construction boom ever last decade, right? We built two hundred twenty three thousand homes in uh, in what was it twenty sixteen? I think it was. That was our biggest year ever of housing construction. You know, yet the federal government has said we're going to somehow magically do one point two million in five years, starting from July one next year. We'd only ever hit over two hundred twenty thousand once in our history. And magically, we're going to do 240,000 for five consecutive years? Come on. Who actually believes we're going to do that? Nobody. The developer, the developers don't believe it. They went literally went to the AFR, um, you know, a property forum last week where, you know, Nigel Slattery, who, who's a who's a developer in WA, basically, he, he tipped that we'll, we'll at best do 560,000, I think he said. So he said basically half, less than half what, what the 1.2 million target said. Tim Gurner, who's copping it in the neck for obviously his stupid statements last last year, or last week, he said that we're basically going to you know have our worst ever housing crisis. That's what he that's what he told the forum. Um, nobody believes they're actually going to hit this one point two million target. Um, yet you know they they continue to gaslight us, saying they're going to do it. And even if they did, it's not going to be enough because they they they're, they're growing the population by this. It's too much. And you can see it's too much. And 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 the, the other thing is, even if we could magically hit the 1.2 million target, or we repeated what we did here, what's the quality going to be like? A lot of this was high-rise apartments. We all know how that turned out last decade. We had flammable cladding. We've had huge structural defects. You know, the the Opal Tower mascot tower, all those sorts of things. We got we've had reports of huge. You know, in Victoria, we've in Melbourne, we've had massive problems with balconies, um, balconies that are unsafe. We've had water leaks. Um, the problem with it is if you try and build houses too quickly in order to keep up with this rampaging population growth, you're going to obviously, you know, compromise in quality, which is exactly what we did last decade when we did this. We had this huge high-rise construction boom. We built a whole lot of crap that was flam- that was clouded in flammable cladding that, you know, was has obviously suffered from a whole bunch of construction faults and has left a lot of people in a lot of trouble. Well, if we do, if we do this on steroids... And try and do it again for five years, but do it at a higher level, and we rush it. We're obviously going to have worse quality again, and we're going to be left with 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 more high rise garbage. Like we could avoid all this if we just simply lower immigra- lower population growth to these kind of levels. We could actually take our time to build proper quality stuff. You know, it's it's not rocket science. None of this is rocket science. But you know, but we're not allowed to talk about it because if you talk about it, you're racist. And you know, it, it, it's it's just ridiculous. Like, it, you know, the the defenders of this stuff want to try and make you believe that running these immigration levels at these extreme levels, at, at, at the extreme levels we're doing, doesn't impact housing the market. Like, the housing market's all about supply. But yes, it's about demand. Look at this. As I said, we had the highest construct, we had the highest supply ever in the nation's history last decade, and we still didn't build enough. And the, and the other point on, on the whole supply thing is the um, OECD housing database, I should have included that in here, showed that Australia's the, you know, uh, lead, lead well, was the fourth, had the fourth highest construction rate in the OECD uh, last decade. And uh, sorry, in up to 2020. And also showed that we've got one of the highest shares of construction workers in the OECD. Like we're way above the OECD average for construction worker share. So it's not like we don't we we we're somehow bad at building homes. Like that whole thing that we are oh, we're just terrible at building homes is a myth. We're actually pretty good at it. The problem is we're way better at immigration, and we run that way hotter than we should. And that's what gives us this permanent housing shortage. And I tell you what, if we increase the population by fourteen point two million people, as projected by the intergenerational report, we're going to have a permanent housing shortage. Because the fact of the matter is, you cannot build, you cannot add a Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, and Adelaide worth of people in 40 years and not create problems. You're going to create a hell of a lot of problems. And, you know, we're not building them in greenfield cities where there's heaps of vacant land and, you know, lots of space to build in. We're, we're basically crush loading them into, you know, really Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, mostly. And those places are already built out. And, you know, it's hard to build there. It's incredibly expensive. 
So we're just going to basically create a permanent housing shortage. This is inflicted by the federal government's mad immigration prog- program, and it doesn't have to do this, but it's doing it. And we don't, and it shouldn't be doing it. So it's about time, you know, policymakers, everyone just just catches on, and um, and starts calling them out for the BS, the gaslightness. This is all they're doing. It's deliberately top down from the federal government, who's decided to just ram through, fire hose the nation with people. And it's basically creating the, the, you know, most of the problems that we've got. And uh, unfortunately, it's not just us. It's, you know, so it's the Trudeau government in Canada. They're doing exactly the same thing. The New Zealand government is doing the same thing. Uh, it's a, it, it seems to be an Anglo disease. And I don't know what the solution is. <laughs> well, part of it, you've got to talk about it. I guess one of the questions um, is, you know, what is the steady state size of the population what should it be right because it shouldn't be where we're heading it should be significantly below that and there are some analyses that suggest actually it should be below 20 20 million right yeah well i mean look the whole thing is you can't you can't suddenly you know lower the population i no. mean you can't send people out but um look i i would be more than happy unfortunately you know unfortunately you can't take back the mistakes we've already done right we've all this has been done we can't, you've got to live with it. But I'd be happy if they just went back to these sorts of settings. And gradually over time, you'd have the baby boomers would die off, et cetera. And we would um, sort of hit that peak population, you know, probably 35 million or something um, would, would would be the the absolute peak. Actually, probably less than that. But, you know, just make sure that the flow. So there's a whole, the whole, the whole secret to solving the housing shortage it's pretty obvious. Shane Oliver said it last last week to the AFR Property Summit. I've been saying it for yonks. You got to run the. You got to make sure the immigration program is commensurate with the nation's ability to, to supply houses, infrastructure, and to also safeguard the environment. So it's got to be within the the environment's carrying capacity. Do that, and you won't have a problem, right? Now, a good rule of thumb. I mean, you know, I can't give you exact figure, but we didn't seem to have these problems when we were running it like that, did we? Like we were always, you know. We didn't, we didn't have these, you know, the, 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 these chronic problems. So maybe good rule of thumb is just to go back to these, these sorts of levels instead of running at these sorts of levels and definitely not this sort of level. That's, you know, kind of what I'd say. Like in terms of what the actual, and, and, and what I love to see is, you know, instead of doing this, um, this referendum of the voice, which um, let's be honest, it looks like it's going to get smashed. And, um, you know, I'd say probably majority of people don't put it, you know, as, as one of their top priorities. We should be running a plebiscite on what Australia's future population is going to be. Like, let the Australian people choose how big they want the country to be. Give them a range of indicators. So, you know, say something like Australia's population is currently 26.4 million people. Um, you know, um, here's what the interaction report says. Uh, well, give them a whole range of different, you know, uh, projections based on what... Um, different immigration rates and let them choose what they want. I guarantee you they wouldn't be choosing 40.2 million that the initiation report says over 40 years because it's bonkers. But let the Australian people choose how big they want Australia to be. And then, and if they can't, the, you know, if they say 30 million, well, then the, the federal government should then use that as the as the target, as to, you know, set immigration policy around what it'll be to get to 30 million or whatever. Or, if it, you know, if it, it comes out 32 million. Well, then you said net overseas migration at probably that sort of level that we hit, had here, and we'd hit it. But, but you know, let 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 people decide. But they don't let us decide. They don't even take it to an election. They just go and basically say nothing during last year's election campaign. Don't even mention it. And then once they got elected, they're now running this extreme levels that um, nobody wants. And every opinion poll basically tells it. You know, tells them that this is on the nose. People don't want it. But they do it anyway because they don't care because because they don't serve us. They serve big business. They serve the big property and they serve the university lobby. They serve the growth lobby over us. They should be serving us because it's a democracy and they're meant to represent us. We're the voters, but they don't represent us. They represent the growth lobby and it's wrong. Spot on. And, uh, of course, there are consequences, right? So the health system can't cope because we've got way more people relative to the the health system's ability to cope. That's one of the reasons why that's creaking at the edges. The roads, of course, aren't um, uh, able to cover 
you know the, the amount of traffic on them so they get snarled and that means that the time it takes to get from a to b goes goes down uh, and then the other point of course is that the the whole structure of society gets sort of wrecked because people can't afford to buy close in because property is too expensive they have to go further out which means they're spending more time traveling rather than actually doing other things and so you 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 get these sort of weird um uh sort of you know, demographic shifts as a result of it all of this all of it can be traced right back to the wrong migration settings right the wrong growth settings i mean it, it is so fundamental and <laughs> yeah people don't want to draw the dots join the dots do they? they don't want to see you know consequences of this are consequences of this are consequences of this are right and then of course they complain when they can't get around and can't see a doctor but this is this is the root cause of the problem 100 percent. and and look you know I, I obviously live in melbourne and i've i've noticed it so I, I i i do boxing a few suburbs away and and i've noticed that my travel times have just gone like in the last few years and um you know i've got confirmation of that in last week's uh demographic data from the ABS like Victoria's population grew by by I think it was 165,000 roughly uh for the year and that means probably 140,000 came to Melbourne uh it's, it's nuts like of course that's gonna you're gonna literally see it and if you keep growing at that rate every year you can add a few minutes to your trip you know from A to B it's just gonna get longer and longer harder and harder and now you know I, I hate driving around Melbourne <laughs> it's just one of, the, one of the beauties of working from home I rarely leave uh, my suburb, um, you know, just do it if I have to go somewhere. But it's just a nightmare now. And, and and you know, like I, I you know, I don't know if one of these nostalgia guys, but like growing up in the 90s in Melbourne was just, when I was, you know, my 20s, was just so much easier. Apart from the fact that housing and everything was cheaper and everything was cheaper. But it was just easy to get around. And now it's just not. Like, you know, livability in Melbourne has been absolutely smashed. And it's been smashed. Because the population of the 2001 census was 3.3 million. And now it's over 5 million. And, you know, based on these sorts of figures and based on intergenerational report, it's probably, you know, it's going to get to 9 million by um, by 2060, which would be in my lifetime. Uh, hopefully, if I don't, you know, um, if, I, if I live a decent length. Um, you know, so in my lifetime, born in 1978 to when I die hopefully in the 2060s if i live that long um you know melbourne's population would have gone from two and a half million or something to nine million <laughs> it's just that is an insane amount of growth um and most of it's been obviously this, this century and you can't grow like that without creating a whole lot of problems everywhere and that's basically what i've seen this you know i've seen my city get destroyed well Oh, I mean, it's a bit melodramatic, but, but but get degraded quite significantly. And it's the same in Sydney. And, you know, southeast Queensland is going to experience the same soon. Um, they, they're growing very quickly. They're just not there yet. They're sort of Melbourne 20 years ago. Um, but you, you can see the writings on the wall and you go, well, why are we doing this? Well, it makes no sense. Like, we don't have to do this, but we're, but they're choosing to do it for no good reason other than just to support their big business, big property and the university lobby and the, you know, you know the the higher, the higher education lobby. Um, but they're not certainly not representing us. And that's what every opinion poll says, pretty much, that no, the overwhelming majority of people don't want this. But they don't care. They're doing it anyway. And they're directly manufacturing a housing shortage. Well, who wants this? You know, and I, you know I've, got, I've got a 15-year-old son and a daughter about to turn 13. And I, and I was just, you know, like, what, what are they going to do in 10 years? Yeah, you know, under these sorts of policies, um, you know, it's just uh, it's just insane. It's like you're stealing your kids' future. Why? You no, know, but but they're doing it. So yeah. you know, we've got to call it out. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting. I'll give you a bit of a an, an, uh, story here. I came to Australia for the first time in 1994, 1995, from the UK. From I worked in London for many years, right? And to me, at that time coming to Australia, to Sydney, it was like a breath of fresh air, right? There was less traffic on the streets. You could get around. Cost of living were lower. Um, cost of property was lower. I mean, it seemed it seemed a perfection, right? And over the time that I was there, you know, I saw this whole thing fall apart to the point 
where you couldn't get around in Sydney. Cost of everything is a lot higher. And I came back to the UK, as you, as you know, a few months ago. The cost of living here is lower than now it was in Sydney, in Sydney, whereas when I came to Sydney, it was the other way around. So, I mean, if you look, if you look at it objectively and stand back, something has gone completely off the rails. And, you know, you've got to say it's the, our political leaders um, who are predominantly responsible. And OK, the Reserve Bank did silly things with lowering interest rates and all that sort of stuff. But that was in a response to some of the other policies. But at the end of the day... Yeah, well, but, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, the Reserve Bank's sort of a cyclical thing, but the structural stuff's the, 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 the yes, federal government. Correct. I was going to say exactly that. It, it, the structural stuff is actually a political set of decisions Decisions they take, or very importantly, decisions they don't take. So, for example, not following through on the infrastructure that's required to be able to support more people, all those sorts of things too. So sometimes it's uh, sins of omission as well as sins of actually, you know, getting more people to come through because they don't actually follow through. And I guess the other point, you know, that this sort of report that comes out, the intergenerational report, has been talking about these issues for a long, long time, but. You know, they, they write reports and talk about it, but nothing happens. So there's a complete disconnect. It's not like we don't know this stuff. It's not like the information isn't around. It's just that it doesn't influence policy decisions on the ground. No, they just they just keep doing it anyway. They they um yeah it, it's it, yeah yeah it's like these it's like these housing affordability reports. We've had mm. about twenty of them in the last <laughs> twenty years. Yes. Yeah, yeah, every year oh, we'll just do another you know another like they, they should have just not done any of them because. I don't know how many millions of dollars they've wasted because they don't listen to them anyway. Um, you know, and, and the last one we got under the previous government was just basically they the whole terms of reference was basically to show that it's a supply problem. Um, you know, and, and the latest thing is, you know, the gaslighting now is everyone's trying to say, oh, we just, we just need more supply. We've got to build, 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 you know. Like it's a supply problem. It's not a demand problem. Just look at the data. It's a demand problem. Uh, you know, it's, it's the number one problem. And, you know... It, it, the, the whole thing is just spin, um, unfortunately, and it's just about trying to pull the wool over our eyes. But luckily, you know, there's a lot to be said for you know social media and the internet and all this sort of stuff. I mean, obviously, you get a lot of a lot of garbage on there and a lot of um, you know conspiracies and whatever. But it does also allow you know commentators like Martin, myself, Tarek, um, others to basically call this BS out because you know. You, you have the wannabe gatekeepers like Liz Allen and Abel Rizzi, but they can't silence us mm. because we've got platforms. Yeah. And um, and that's the beautiful thing about it. Like they're, um, you know, at least at least we can sort of, you know, uh, alert people about these sorts of things, um, you know, which is, I guess, one positive. But, yeah, I just can't see it changing. I mean, if, if, if the pandemic didn't kill this, what's going to kill it? Like... <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I was gobsmacked that, uh, and Shane Oliver made the point last week at the AFR property summer. He said, well, we should have, you know, he, he came out straight out and said, look, the nub of the issue with the housing shortage is that we ramped up immigration in 2005. He just came out and said it. And, and he said that basically we should have, shouldn't have gone back to this model after the, um, the pandemic, but they have. They haven't just gone back to it. They've doubled down and they've tried to catch up. It's um, you know, Dan Tian, the uh, the opposition immigration spokesman. Yeah, you made a good analogy. You got to got to hand got to give him credit for this. He said that basically, you know, a reporter asked him, oh, "Aren't we just catching up for the lost immigration over the pandemic?" And he said, "Well, that's." He said, "Do you catch up? You know, if you if you get stopped at roadworks on the highway, and you know you're stopped for for an hour at roadworks, do you then drive for 200, 200 kilometers an hour for the next hour hour and a bit to make up your time? No." That's, you know, but that's what they want to do with immigration. So the whole supply side of the economy was stifled during the pandemic, right? But then in order to catch up this so-called imaginary lost immigration, they're now running, they've actually doubled the demand. And of course, it's growing the, the problems we're seeing here with the rental market, et cetera. You know, it's just bonkers. Like, why do we need to catch up? And, and in fact, we already have caught up pretty much. It shows you here. And we're about to overtake the the pre pre COVID population trend, so it's not just about catching up; it's about shooting more past it. And we're doing it, you know, we, we we're doing it in a really short period of time when the supply side of the economy is constrained and it can't keep up. 
And of course, that's what we're getting right here. Thanks to Shane Oliver. Beautiful chart, that. Shows you exactly what we're getting. And it's going to get worse. So, um, yeah, I'm not saying the rents, the rental inflation is going to stay at, you know, around 10%. Uh, it's over 10% of the capital cities. Um, there are affordability constraints, but it's going to stay, you know, high and higher than wage growth based on this data for, you know, God knows how long. They keep running immigration like this, population growth like this. We're going to have a permanent housing shortage. And it's just, you know, why are we doing this? It just makes no sense. And I think Except it's unless it, you know, yeah, I, sorry, I, I, unless you look at it through the eyes of the growth lobby, then it makes perfect sense. I was going to say for you and me, it doesn't yeah. make sense. No, it doesn't make sense. And by the way, it also sets into context the RBA and you know interest rates and everything else. Because if if you look about the amount of verbiage it's written about what the RBA is going to do and how this interest rate of zero point two five percent may or may not be coming, all of that sort of stuff, you know, the truth is that it is this high population problem that's created the financial pressure on households more than anything else because house prices have shot through the roof that chart from Shane shows the problem right the reason that house prices have gone so high is migration as well as obviously lowering interest rates so the property market that we've got today is a product of the high migration that we've had for the last 20 to 30 years so it's all connected right and trying to sheet it back to the RBA, because the um, government can say, well, the RBA is independent, so what they do is nothing to do with us. What we've got is a problem that's been created by government policy, right? Not the RBA. Yeah, 100%. Now, the, um, you know, it's, it's another thing I hate about what's happened to, I guess, the, you know, the policy making in this country is they've effectively ceded control of the economy to the RBA has got one instrument, hmm. when really the RBA should be just a supplement. And it should be the fiscal policy should be basically, you know, doing all the structural things for the economy. Um, so, you know, you've got, you got the RBA, it's basically got one one hammer, one interest rate hammer, trying to control the whole macro economy when really the federal government should be doing it. And, yep. and Phil Lowe actually made that statement in his department in speech. And, yep. um, yeah, <laughs> as you and I way, said earlier on, it's always easy to say yeah. as you leave, right? <laughs> Why That's didn't it, he... Mate, it, it, <laughs> It always happens though. Joe yes. Hockey, last yeah. validatory speech, negative gearing. We should, yeah. Negative gearing's bad. We should get rid of it. It's like, yeah, yeah. but you just spent the last bloody four years defending it while you're a treasurer. Oh. And then now you're, you know, you're walking out the door. It's like, I oh, get rid of it. And then, you know, this always happens. Like you always get the Damascus moment at the end. You know, as you've got one foot out the door about to leave, they go, uh, and by the way, um, X, Y, Z, see ya, you know. Um, so yeah, Phil Lowe in his final speech, basically, you know, a couple of weeks ago, was it last week, week before, week before, said, um, basically, you know, fiscal and monetary policy has got to work together, not across purposes. Shock horror, you know. Like at the moment, Tarek Brooker coined this phrase, and it's a beauty. I've used it a few times in Sky interviews and stuff. Um, he, he called it the uh, the burnout economy. Yep. Uh, Australia's got a burnout economy. So basically, the RBA has got the foot planted firmly on the brake. You know, through its high, you know, high interest rates, etc. While the federal government has got its foot planted firmly on the accelerator by running, pumping demand by running the most highest and most extreme immigration program this nation's ever seen, and they're working across purposes. And we're seeing it through the rental market, obviously, but also you know on the inflation side, um, most notably through rents. So we got property rents, you know, obviously rising at double digit pace across the capital cities, and Rents are the single biggest driver, single, single biggest uh, component of the CPI. So they count for about 6%. So, you know, we've got this, this tailwind effectively, um, you know, from this high population growth pushing up inflation. And Phil Lowe actually said, uh, I think in the May or June, a couple of months ago in one of the, one of the uh, Senate estimates, he basically said that the, uh, the demand side of the economy through because of immigration is basically, um, you know, outrunning the supply side. Um, and he actually referred to, you know, he said the population has grown by 2% or 2.5%, I think is what he said. Has Have we built 2.5% more houses? Have we built done 2.5% more business investment? Have we done 2.5% more infrastructure? No, we haven't. And that was basically a shot at the immigration policy and saying that effectively we're running this burnout economy. I'm trying to rain inflation in and the government's basically 
got the foot on the accelerator pumping in all these people. And it's basically, you know, it's outrunning the supply side through the housing market, which pushing up rents. The, um, you know, infrastructure, like it's outrunning, um, it's creating congestion across infrastructure. It's not building enough infrastructure. It's outrunning business investment. So it's creating capital shallowing, which I'd argue is one of the reasons why we've got this low, this population tanking. Oh, sorry, this productivity tanking. So when, when, when the pandemic hit, a whole bunch of migrants went home. We had half a million temporary migrants leave. And um, and effectively got this capital deepening effect, I'd argue, which is basically when you get more capital per worker. And that's one of the reasons why pop why productivity went up. Um, so of course it's not the only reason. This is just sort of, you know, pretty stylized. But now we've got this mass population growth. We're getting this capital shallowing where effectively the amount of capital, so that's like, you know, uh, machinery and that sort of stuff. Uh, infrastructure, all that kind of stuff per person is actually shrunk. And that means that's made us less productive. So now we get this negative productivity impact. And that's kind of one of the reasons why we've had this like whipsaw in productivity. It went up when immigration went to negative and it's gone down and it's rocketed back. Um, you know, and, and, and Phil Lowe sort of called that out a few months ago when we were sending estimates. And that's one of the, re- you know, it's a basically... And, and he needed to call it out because he's trying to, he was trying to do his job by raising, you know, using his one hammer, his one tool to keep to reigning inflation while the federal government's basically working at cross purposes, doing the burnout economy thing, causing the economy to burn out by running this high immigration. Hmm. And that was effectively what he sort of said in his final speech. He goes, we've got to work together. You've got to have fiscal policy working with monetary policy. But the federal government in the last 20 odd years or ever since the inflation targeting came in, has basically said, no, nah, no, nah, that's not our job. That's We just leave it to the independent central bank who's got one tool, which is, you know, ridiculous from a policy perspective when you think about it. And in fact, of course, Chalmers have actually put a further distance between the RBA and government, right? Because up to this point, you know, the government has the ability potentially to um, you know, influence what the RBA might or might not do, right? Whereas they want to sort of separate it even more so they can wash their hands even more firmly and say, nothing to do with us, it's those RBA people who created the problem, right? When in fact, <laughs> what you need is a better, a more integrated view, but one that actually dri- is driven from, you know, what is the, I guess, questions like, what sort of Australia do we want? How big do we want Australia to be? What sort of life do we want to have in Australia? I mean, those are the big questions. And, you know, those are never on the ballot paper, are they? No, of course not. And, uh, and and you know, a lot of people kind of know it in the gut that this is happening, but they don't, you know, I'm sorry, if, if, you're, if you're just Joe, Joe, Joe Blow punter, he doesn't watch these sorts of shows and mm. whatever, like, you know, um, yeah, they probably feel that it's, they've probably got an idea, but they don't really know because it's, you know, it, it, it's only... Um, probably people who watch the show, you know, you and me, uh, who've been in the weeds and this stuff for years. Yes. Uh, you, you know, what, what, one of the, bound, the downsides of doing macro business for, was it, uh, 12 years is that you you kind of see how the sausage is made because you're tracking this stuff every day. And, you know, Tara could see it as well. Like he, he, he He's always digging in the weeds and this stuff. And it's pretty rancid yeah. when, you, when you actually pull back Absolutely. the onion. It is. It and is, you absolutely. see all this stuff, and then you yeah. then you kind of like it hit me sort of five years. Well, uh, really hit me about five years ago. It took me years to sort of learn all the pieces. Uh, I'm still I'm still learning, obviously, but um, but you know, I've kind of got a, a good BS detector these days, and um, you know, you can kind of see like nowadays I can see when someone's trying to gaslight us and you know talking through their rear end, and unfortunately. That happens nine times out of ten. So it's uh, you know it's very rare to get someone actually speak up and tell the truth these days. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it, it's, yeah, a, it's, it's about the announceable, shocking. isn't it? I mean, the, the housing policy, you know, the ten billion is a great example. It sounds really good until you actually start looking at it. And think, how on? Mate, how many that, do that, we that, need? How much are we actually putting <laughs> in? What return are we going to get from that? You know, it's like well, you're going to get two and six months. It's not going to make much difference at all. But it sounds a good. And of course, um, they they flog it to death. And of course, the Greens well, now are saying are saying, well, now you know we're going to focus on the rental sector because we've got one third of the voting population who are living in the rental sector, so we need to be seeing to be supporting them. So there's a whole bunch of political shenanigans going on here all the time. Yeah, and unfortunately, the Greens are almost, you know, so Max Chandler Mather, who's hmm. the um, you know the housing spokesman, 
came out and defended the big immigration a few months ago. He yep. said that you know he, he didn't agree that it that it was had anything to do with the housing crisis and that we need the migrants and it's great and all this sort of stuff. And it's like, for starters, mate, you were supposed to represent the Australian environment. You call yourself the Greens, um, as the State of the Environment report says. It's pretty much you can't think of a worse thing to do to the Australian environment than grow the population like a science experiment. Like it's pretty there. It's there in black, black and white in that report. If you bother to read it. <laughs> which your party purports to represent, which yes. you don't. Yes. Right? Uh, <laughs> complete flog. But anyway, um, you know, but but the Greens, the way I read it is the Greens saying, okay, we, we've created this wedge. We can basically create the renters as our constituents. So they actually support immigration now. Like That's what, I mean, everyone should support immigration, but I'm talking about extreme immigration, right? They support these extreme immigration levels because it's going to rapidly... It's going to make the rental crisis worse and it's also going to increase the number of renters. So therefore, it's going to increase their their voting block. And it's going to give them more seats, more power, more Senate spots, all that stuff. It's going to create, make them a bigger political force. Um, now, that's all self-interested, of course. That's not good for us. It's not good for their constituents. But it's good for the Greens because they can create a wedge and basically... Uh, create its own, you know, become a bigger player in the political space hmm. by through this high immigration, create, creating the rental crisis, which then they can then wax lyrical about and pretend they care about uh, and then capture that side of the vote. Well, you bring so, more you people know, in, so the rental sector goes up. So that means they've got a more of a target population that they can go after. It's simple math. Yeah, and then it? they can go, they can they, they can do gimmicks. <laughs> yeah. They talk about a rental freeze, which are never yeah. going to come in. Yeah. Right? And, yeah. and they can just, you know, they can just, you know, chastise the major parties and say, oh, you know, isn't it terrible? Isn't it terrible? While they're actually supporting the thing that's making it terrible or the key driver that's making it terrible. So, you know, it's it's just cynical politics, unfortunately. And, mm. you know, all three major parties are the same. Like they're, you know, they're slightly different shades. You know, Tab, Tab Cole is the Greens. You got Pepsi and Coke are the lab, Labor and Liberals. And it's all, you know, slightly different flavours, slightly different sugar content. All going to give you diabetes, um, you know, if you drink too much, potentially, you know, tooth decay and, you know, obesity. So they're all bad, but it's just, you know, pick your poison. <laughs> You're one of the three. Um, you know, does, so does it that, make that's much unfortunately difference? the system. Yeah. Yeah. No, it doesn't, mate. No. And, and, and you know, if anybody, uh, if any party should be sued for the name, actually, Labor's the same. Like they're supposed to, you know, Labor, we represent the working class. No, you don't. You don't, mate. Um, the Greens... You know, you're not an environmental party. You're an environmental destructor if you if you support this sort of stuff. The problem with it is, everyone just can can say net zero three times, and it absolves all sins. Like you just go, oh, oh net zero, net zero, net zero, net zero. You say that every second word, and then you can do whatever you want to the environment. You can, you know, have land clearing and you know habitat loss and all this other stuff through this extreme, you know, he heaps of waste all through this extreme population growth but if you just keep saying net zero all sins are absolved it's contentless it's, it's contentless <laughs> that's it, it, it net, net zero has become a marketing yeah. term at this, yeah, this at this point yeah it's like you know like, like i've never understood how how's it even possible to get down to this net zero um let alone when you're growing the population by 50 percent mm. over 40 years as which is what the plan like it's just you know every time someone goes and buys a flat screen tv how much bloody resources are in that? Um, you know, emissions and everything, and energy use and all that stuff. Like, it, 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 is are we going to achieve net zero because we're going to produce absolutely zero in this country? We're going to import everything. Is that is that? And then you go, oh, we're not created; it's created in China, so therefore it's not our net zero. Like, it's just the whole thing doesn't make sense to me. Um, you know, like I'm all I'm all for energy efficiency. I'm all for um, you know, really Australians. Just, well, people just need to consume less. Like. Um, just don't upgrade your TVs as often. Don't like make everything last longer is probably the best thing you can do for the environment. Problem is if you do that, the economy collapses because the economy is based around consumption. Yes. Right. They want you to turn your phones over every year. They want you to buy a new car every couple of years. They want you to constantly buy new junk. So you throw out your old junk, but really what we should do, and I'm a bit of a tight ass. So I, I, I don't, um, you know, I try and like, I drive a car for, you know, 14 year old car and I try and drive it until it dies sort of thing. Um, I'm like that with everything. But really, 
you know, the best thing you do for the economy is uh, for the for the environment is just try not to consume as much and, and make your make whatever you buy last till it dies. It's like, about don't su- just sustain it long term rather than building obsolescence, which is what so much yeah, stuff has, right? Yeah. Yep. And, so. and 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 one of the biggest farces is when uh, like someone said to me recently, go because I you know drive an old Falcon and it's like you know it's a two thousand four Falcon I think it was I bought a G- GFC for like ten grand best buy ever. Anyway, it's, yeah, it's getting a little bit long the tooth now, but um, you know, like I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to get rid of it until it dies. So it's just you know it, it's getting close now. But you know, someone said, oh, you should you should buy a more efficient car. I'm like. Yeah, okay, whatever. And they go, well, you should buy a, you know, try and buy an electric car. I'm like, well, for starters, it's, you know, expensive. I love to buy one, but they're super expensive. And I'm like, well, what do you think is going to happen to that car when I get rid of it? It's going to go straight to the tip, right? And me buying a new car, okay, it might be more fuel efficient in the short run, but there's a hell of a lot embedded energy that's gone into buying that car, into making the car and all this energy and resources and everything. You're better off just using the one you got and driving it for as long as you can. Just rather than getting rid of it, goes to the scrap heap so you can have a marginal improvement in your, you know, your energy use on the next car. Um, it's like, you know, you're not going to replace your phone for another phone that uses 10% less energy. That's just what, because a hell of a lot of energy goes into making the phone in the first place yeah. and resources and waste and everything. So you're better off just holding on to everything for longer. But the problem is if everyone did that, we'd have a depression because the whole society is built around consumption. Correct. And that actually so it doesn't that- really work. No. And it, but it comes back to the fundamental question, which is perhaps where we should close the show tonight, which is what is society about? Who's it for, right? And if it's actually about ultimately to make big, big, big business richer and the, you know, the owners of big business richer, and to do that, you need more people to buy more stuff to be able to keep keeping buying more and you know more and more and more. That's one future, but that's not a future that necessarily is sustainable, nor is it actually particularly um, you know, useful for those people who are caught up in it. But it is actually the rat rat run that most people are on, unfortunately, because that's the way that society has been built. So the question is, what's a better alternative? There are alternative models, there are different ways of doing it, but only if we actually change the rules of the game. And unfortunately, the people who set the rules of the game are the people who benefit from the current rules. Yep, so uh, fortunately, I think we're gonna be having this conversation for the next 10 years. <laughs> well, we'll keep having it, Leith, we'll keep having it, and I appreciate your, your, your time tonight. Just f- uh, for the record, if people would like to uh, find out more about what you do and w- where do they go? All right, there's, there's a few spots. Um, f- first and foremost, uh, macrobusiness.com.au. Um, uh, myself and uh, Dave Leon Smith um, run that, have for about 12 years, uh, 13 years, I think it is, um, we started. And basically, that's just an independent, um, you know, economic and uh, commentary site. Um, you know, talks about all this kind of stuff, uh, pulls, d- doesn't pull any punches, goes after the rent seekers. Uh, if, if someone attacks me, I attack them back. Um, you know, that sort of stuff, uh, you know, calls out all this BS. So macrobusiness.com.au. The other thing is um, I've got a YouTube channel, which is small at fledgling. It's, it's uh, Leith Vo, L-E-I-T-H-V-O. Um, now that that channel, all it is, like, so they, it's nothing like yours, Martin. It's not professional. It's not great like your, your channel. But what it is, <laughs> it's a centralised depository. Like, so I've, I've been doing heaps of media interviews lately on um, Sky News and, uh, I do a radio show on 2GB every week called the Treasury Common Sense, etc. And they're all scattered everywhere. So they're all like, you know, over here, whatever. So what I've done is I've basically just been putting them on my YouTube channel. So if, if you want to see my media, uh, like my TV and radio interviews, just go to Leithvo, L-E-I-T-H-V-O. And um, that's just basically my deposit, central repository of media, of um, radio and TV effectively. So... I don't really do anything else. I don't have time to produce and, you know, create stuff. But, um, yeah, if you think, oh, I want to see what he's been doing on TV and, and Sky News and interviews and that sort of stuff, that's that's where I put that. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it, macro business. And number one and number two, uh, YouTube channel just for my media. Terrific, Leif. Well, 
wonderful at all you do a great job and uh, thanks very much for, for, for keep keeping preaching the gospel right really really important stuff um we'll have you back on again down the track of course and uh, we'll keep uh, sharing information and, uh, and and pushing against the mainstream because this is such a critical critical conversation so thanks very much indeed for your time this evening and i'm going to take you off off air now and i'll just uh, close the show see you later Lee. thank you very much cheers man thanks everyone so there you go, folks. A um, bit of an extended chat, but this was so important and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much for all the comments. Uh, thanks for the super chats. Really appreciate it. Next week, um, I'll have Chris Bates, mortgage broker, on talking about Sydney property. So we'll get a perspective from him as to what he's seeing with regard to this crazy property market. Uh, thank you very much. Have a wonderful week. Um, check out our other shows, the recorded shows during the week, and I'll be back uh, next week for another show. So this is Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics signing off. Cheerio.